1 Samuel 13, and we'll look at the first 15 verses. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel for 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had a trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand in the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. When the Israelites saw that the situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. And so he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmas, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. And I have not sought the Lord's favour. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And appointed him ruler of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went to Gibeah in Benjamin. And Saul counted the men who were with them. They numbered about 600. May God bless that reading of his word. Thank you very much, Steve. And good morning. Uh, it is our, our custom here to, to systematically preach through a book of the Bible. We're in the, the Old Testament because the, the New Testament tells us to keep a balance between the New and the Old. So we're in the Old Testament now. We're, we're starting a, a study in the life of David. Uh, but just before we get to David, we want to uh, set the scene by telling you about King Saul, his predecessor. David was Israel's greatest king. But he was actually only the second king. The very first king was called King Saul, and that's who we've heard about today. So we're just setting the scene for our study on David in the next couple of weeks. Now, back, back in the olden days when I, when I was a school teacher, our family car was the traditional classic rust bucket. It had about 150,000 miles on the clock, petrol engine, uh, so it was really well past its sell-by date and it's becoming very, very unreliable. So we took advantage of one of those minimum 500 pound part exchange deals and we bought a Ford Sierra that was only five years old. And it only had 50,000 miles on the clock. That was the newest and poshest car I've ever owned. And this was 25 years ago. I drove it home, put it on the drive, showed my, my wife Lane and, and said, look, we've joined the group that now has a posh car. Wow. We're like the rest of our street. Two weeks later, only two weeks later, I got up on a Sunday morning, ready to take the family to the church. I opened the front door and my jaw fell to the ground. Because when I looked at the car, the back windscreen was shattered. 
I looked on the partial, parcel shelf to see if a tile had fallen off the roof and, and broken the glass, but it hadn't. I looked to see if the, if the wind had blown a stone onto the glass. Nothing. I checked inside to see if anything had been stolen, and they hadn't. They'd even left my Led Zeppelin cassettes, <laughs> which are very valuable, you understand that. Nothing had been taken. As to this day, I still don't know why it happened, other than the glass was shattered. The plans for the day suddenly changed. We called a, called a friend who came and took Lynn and the kids to church, and I went on a tour around the scrapyards trying to find a replacement. The car that we'd been so delighted with, that was so lovely, was now, well, disaster had, disaster had struck. I think the Lord was very clearly teaching me not to be so worldly and to, to put my trust in such things. And the same happens with King Saul. King Saul who had started off so well, but today we see him being told that he's a fool and his son will not inherit the, the throne from him. It will give, be given to another. King Saul, who'd start off so well, but now disaster strikes. As I said, it all started so well. Last week, we heard how the people went to Samuel, the prophet, and said, give us a king like the other nations. And the, the, Samuel was really upset like that, about that because he knew that the people were saying, we don't want God as our king. We want a human king like the other nations, which is sinful. But God agreed and let them choose somebody tall, dark and handsome, as they say. And King Saul was, was uh, appointed as king. And everybody in, in 1 Samuel 10 shouted, long live the king. Everything got off to a great start. The Israelites would all be patting each other on the back saying, we made a great choice with this guy, didn't we do well? like all leaders he had a honeymoon period and by chapter 13 here the honeymoon period is over by chapter 13 of 1 Samuel here we see that Israel is under the rule of the Philistines the Philistines Philistia is over on the west by the coast of Mediterranean yes Israel but they actually the Philistines had come into the land of Israel and they were even right over by the Jordan here. So King Saul gathered together an army of 3,000 soldiers. He took command of 2,000 soldiers and he gave his grown-up son, Jonathan, command of 1,000 <coughs> soldiers. And the battle takes place about seven miles north of Jerusalem, which is here. So the battle taken just north of Jerusalem. In verse C, verse 3, we see that Jonathan goes out and he attacks the Philistines at Geba. And what happens next? Saul blows his own trumpet, liberally, and the press release from his office says that Saul has attacked the Philistines. In verse 4, all Israel heard the news, Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost. Who attacked them? Jonathan. Who took the credit? Saul. What kind of bloke takes the credit for something that his son has done? He should be cheering Jonathan on. Not taking the credit for something Jonathan has done. The main leader takes the credit for his second in command. Which begs the question, where was the main leader when the leading needed to be done? Why was the second in command taking the lead? Because the commander in chief, King Saul, had abdicated his responsibility. I wonder if we see this sometimes in our homes, where the leader abdicates his responsibility to his second in command. In the church here, we are 
the, the elders are quite clear about male leadership in the church and in the home. The phrase is complementarian, where the men and women complement each other. That isn't to say, oh, how lovely you are, darling. Not that kind of compliment, but strengths and weaknesses complementing each other. Men, are you the leader in your household? And don't say yes when my wife gives me permission. Men, be leaders in your household. The Bible says you should. But so sometimes we see the women taking the lead in spiritual matters. When the family gathers for prayer, is it the woman? Is it the wife who says, let's pray together? When it's time for a Bible story for the kids, is it the wife who, who says, let's read together? Men, don't let the second in command take the lead. Men, be men in your household. Be a man of God who regularly gently takes his wife's hand to lead her in prayer. Men, take responsibility for the spiritual welfare of your family. To God given responsibility, so rise to it, men. So your children grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 8, Saul, sorry, the prophet Samuel goes to King Saul and tells him, go to Gilgal and wait there seven days. Go ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come and tell you what to do. Saul, go to Gilgal. And what are you going to do there? Wait seven days. Samuel the prophet will come and he will sacrifice the burnt offerings to the Lord. So verse 7. Saul goes to Gilgal and he waits for Samuel and he waits and he waits. But there's no sign of the prophet. His men are quivering with fear since Jonathan's defeat of the Philistines has made them really angry. And some of his men have deserted him. Some of them have even joined the Philistines. Oh dear. It's not going so well for the mighty King Saul now. Samuel's instructions were really clear. Go to Gilgal and wait seven days. What don't you understand about that, Saul? Go there and wait. Samuel will come and do the sacrifices. Then he'll tell you what to do. It's simple, isn't it? But Saul is getting anxious as the days go by. Day one, day two, day three. I'm still waiting, I'm still waiting. Day four, day five. Where are you, Samuel? Are you coming? Day six. Samuel, come on, where are you? And see him by day seven. He's, King Saul is pacing up and down, saying, Samuel, come on, you said you'd be here. You said you'd be here by day seven. It's day seven. Where are you? Samuel, I'm going to give you another 30 minutes, and then I'll do the sacrifices. I've given you enough time and you've blown it. I'm not waiting any longer. So in verse 9 he says, Bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered the burnt offering. Saul offers up the burnt offering to the Lord. Trouble is, he wasn't allowed to do that. Because he was a king. Only the priests, or a prophet, was allowed to offer up burnt sacrifices to the Lord. And just as he's finishing offering, doing the burnt offerings to the Lord, uh, who's that on the horizon? Oh yes, it's Samuel. Samuel's coming. Verse 10, just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him with a big smile on his face. You know what I've done, Samuel? Yeah, it was great. But Samuel's not pleased. Samuel is not pleased with him. In verse 13 he says, Saul, what have you done? Now those words, what have you done? Think of a mother picking up her, her kids from nursery school and the kid hands her this, this painting done by a three-year-old and, and mum says, oh, tell me what you've done. Uh, it's not that kind of voice. It's the kind of voice where you go to your teenager after you've had a phone call from the school head teacher saying, we need to talk about your child's behaviour. 
and you go and get your teenager and says, what have you done? That's the tone of voice from Samuel. And Saul tells him, but he, no hint of apology, he starts to justify his actions. Verse 11, when I saw that the men were scattering, and that he did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now that the Philistines will come down against me, Gilgal, and I had not sought the Lord's favour, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Sounds perfectly reasonable, doesn't it? Look, Samuel, we were out of favour with the Philistines, and we can't go into battle without the Lord's blessing, so I saw the Lord's blessing. That's a good thing, isn't it? You weren't here, so I had to roll my sleeves up and get on with it myself. But Samuel's not impressed. Samuel the prophet is not impressed. He tells King Saul that his actions were foolish. Because of receiving the Lord's blessings, he's lost it. He's lost the Lord's blessing. The Lord's favour has been withdrawn. Verse 13. Saul, you've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. King Saul would still be allowed to carry on as king, but his son, Jonathan, will not inherit the throne from him. The family dynasty will end after one generation. How tragic. Because of his disobedience, another king will be chosen. Now, who chose Saul? The people did. The people chose a, a king like the other nation. Somebody who's tall. Somebody who's impressive. As we heard in the children's story earlier. Somebody who looked great on the outside. But was rotten to the core on the inside. So God says, I'm going to remove this king of your choosing. Because remember, you got what you asked for. I'm going to give you a king now, and he's going to be a man after my own heart. So you can stay on the throne, but it's not going to last. I'm going to give you a man after my own heart. And that, of course, would be David, who at the time was just a shepherd boy. If you were here last week, you may remember that we, we looked in Deuteronomy 18 to see the instructions that the Israelites must carry out when they do appoint a king. When he, when he takes the throne, when the king takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write out for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from, the, the, from that of the Levitical priests. It's to be with him and he's to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. When the king takes office... The first thing he's got to do is to sit down with the, the first five books of the Old Testament and write them out by hand. Have, have you ever done that yourself? Anybody? <clears throat> Neither have I. <laughs> Neither have I. There's no point reinventing the wheel. But in those days, scriptures were not readily available. So the, any king was meant to write out the Bible in his own handwriting. That means you're re really going to have to internalise it. He was to write it out and make sure that he followed those instructions every single day. And who was going to oversee this? The priests were. You know, in a way that in a school, the headmaster, the head teacher, does not have ultimate authority. Above the head teacher is the, the board of governors. The head teacher is answerable to the governors, aren't they? Well, so is a king of Israel. He is answerable to the priests who have authority over him. The words, I'm the leader, nobody tells me what to do, should never be found on the lips of a king of Israel. Now the Bible says that he's accountable. 
He's accountable to the priest. Accountability is a really, really important biblical principle. Accountability. The Bible knows nothing of a leader who is not accountable to other people. Even the Lord Jesus was accountable. In John chapter 5, Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. The Lord Jesus was accountable to the Father. He only did what the Father told him to do. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, who is God, of course. So Jesus was accountable. The Apostle Paul, when he was commissioned along with Barnabas in, in Acts 13 to go out on his first missionary journey, he was sent by the church in Antioch and they did a tour of all around Asia Minor. And what did, he, what did Paul do when he came back? He reported back to the church elders everything that the Lord had done. Acts 14, they sailed back to Antioch, Paul and Barnabas, on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that the, the Lord had done through them. Imagine a group of elders speaking to the mighty Apostle Paul saying, Come on and give me a count. Tell us what you've been doing for these last few months you've been away. That's, that's God's way. Everybody has to be accountable to other people. That's one of the reasons why a church should never have a single elder. In our church we have a plurality of elders and all of us are equal in authority. I, I as full-time elder, as pastor, I am not the first leader with the other elders underneath me, like a head teacher and, and a deputy head. No, all of the elders are equal in authority. And I'm grateful for that because I am accountable to our elders as they are accountable to one another. I, I need these guys. I need these guys. I need them to cheer me on. I need these guys to hold me back. I need these guys to ask me tough questions about my prayer life. I need them to ask tough questions about my marriage. I, ask, I need them to ask tough questions about my internet history. My heart is sinful. I have a sinful heart. I, if, if, if you knew the things that my heart would think of, you'd be sacking me. Instantly, I have a sinful heart. And you know what? So do you. So do you. We have an enemy of our soul who hates the Lord Jesus. He hates, Satan hates Jesus with a passion. And he will, he will try everything in his power to get us to seriously mess up. To seriously sin. To find our satisfaction in, in the toys of this world. And the pleasures of this world. Rather than in Jesus Christ. First of all. Satan. Has got you. In his sights. Me, me too. He's got me in his sights. And this is why accountability is so important. Because when you accountable to one another it's, it's just an incredibly healthy thing to do to be able to sit in a small group of men together or ladies together and look each other in the eye and say tell me how it's going tell me tell me how it's really going tell me about your bible reading tell me about your prayer life tell me about your marriage tell me about your internet history and with love and encouragement will support each other through through a life of purity. We've begun to explore in the elders. We've only just dipped our toe in the water, but we've begun to explore how we can have accountability partners or, or trade triplet, triplets perhaps. People who will love each other deeply and support and encourage each other in our battle against sin.
And when we do roll this out, I really want to encourage you all to get involved. Because being accountable to one another, when you have to, when you know that you're going to be asked next week some hard questions, you're going to up your game. You're going to really say, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to look at that because I know I'm going to be asked about it next week. It's a wonderful, a powerful, effective way of staying on the straight and narrow. Being accountable to one another is one of the greatest weapons we have against the enemy of our souls. Some will be, we'll all be struggling in different ways. Some of us may be struggling with anger. Some of us may be struggling with the desire for money and power. Some of us will be struggling with pride. Some of us will be struggling with laziness. Some of us will be struggling in our relationship to our husband and wife. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to renew our hearts. We need to renew our own minds so that we will choose obedience over selfishness, unlike King Saul. And we need the support of one another. We need the Holy Spirit to renew our hearts. We need to renew our minds. And we need the support and help of one another because together we are stronger, aren't we? Together we are stronger. Let me close by saying that the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear when it says, moving on from those slides, the Bible is clear. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is just, and will forgive us all our sin and purity from all unrighteousness. Forgive us every last thing. Generally we think this is confessing to God in prayer. And it is confessing to prayer our, to God. In prayer, our sins is, is just first base, isn't it? But confessing to one another is a really helpful thing. Not, not if I, if I say, oh, let, let's have a moment time, then you, you come out to the front and announce some of the selfish things you've done. No, in small groups where we will encourage one another, where we will love one another, and support each other and pray for one another, then we'll, it'll help, won't it? It'll help. We'll not be perfect until the Lord Jesus takes us. But it, it will be an effective help. Confession to God and confession in small, confidential groups where you'll be lovingly supported is very effective. We have a wonderful God who's already won the victory over all of our sin. So that if, if you confess his sins, he's declared he will forgive every last bit of the unrighteousness in your heart. You remember there was a time when Peter went up to the Lord Jesus and said, Jesus, how many times should I forgive me, brother? Seven times seven? That's impressive, isn't it? <coughs> Jesus says no. 70 times 7. Actually, look, Peter said 7 times. 7 times. I, I'll count them. Is 7 times enough to forgive the brother? And Jesus said, no, 70 times 7. In other words, don't keep a record. Don't keep count. Keep on forgiving and forgiving and forgiving your brother. How much more would God forgive us? If that's what God expects us to do, to keep on forgiving people, how much more will he forgive us. The really old hymn that says there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open and you may go in. At Calvary's cross where is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Any sinners here this morning? Put my hand up first. Yeah, we can come to Jesus. This is a wonderful God who loves you so very, 
very much. And that love is most clearly shown in the sacrifice of his own dear son who died in Calvary in your place as your substitute for all of the sins in your life. This is the Lord who loves you, who forgives you and who picks you up and restores you again. Praise his great and holy name that he should love us so much.